For 78 years since the end of World War II, the origin of the strange phenomenon called Foo Fighters remains a mystery. Seen by Allied aircraft over Europe and in the Pacific Theater, glowing balls of energy, apparently under intelligent control, tracking your aircraft's height and speed, then flying off, or simply disappearing. Were they a novel German terror weapon, or was a pivotal time in human history being monitored by a higher intelligence? World War II was fought and won using advanced technology. Radar is credited with winning the war for the Allies and the terrible power of the atomic bomb certainly ended the conflict. What exactly were Foo Fighters? Who was controlling them? And why did the phenomenon disappear after World War II? This film examines the facts revealing new evidence that Foo Fighters were under intelligent control and part of a brave new world, a new world order where humans, for the first time, fought wars by weaponizing physics. The team today is Race Hobbs veteran broadcaster James Warrow, science researcher. His investigation into Randersham Forest and the highly strange in general goes back decades. <laughs> Actually, it's not that old, but he knows stuff. He has a photographic memory. He researches books. He talks to people. He has a library of stuff that you don't have. It's not just web-based research. James Warrow knows stuff from science reports, from universities, academic papers that are very, very interesting relating to this case. And US Air Force John Burroughs, who effectively is our team leader. If it wasn't for John, none of us would actually be involved in our different ways. John has known Race Hobbs for years, and John met up with James Warrow years ago. John's quest is to find out exactly what he was exposed to in Rendlesham Forest in December 1980. He was injured by something. His heart valves were affected, his eyes were affected, and possibly his whole body DNA was altered by exposure to a non-ionizing radiation source and high levels of plasma. For years, he fought his case for compensation through the VA, the Veterans Association. John Burroughs' compensation case was initially denied because the U.S. Department of Defense had classified the whole incident. And because it was classified, John Burroughs couldn't make a claim through the VA because they didn't know it actually existed. So John turned to Senator John McCain, who used his government contacts and his expert aides to investigate why the incident that injured Air Force personnel was so deeply classified. This government doctor went on the public record to say he had only come across three sets of medical records that were so classified. Adolf Hitler's death, the JFK assassination, and John Burroughs. What were they hiding? And fascinating, one of the main reasons that John Burroughs' case was settled is because of the Condine Report, a British MOD report into flying saucers that specifically mentions humans injured at the twin bases of Bentwaters and Woodbridge in Suffolk in 1980. The Rendlesham Forest case. As soon as John Burroughs and his legal team presented the British MOD evidence that the incident really happened, his case was settled. But in court, John Burroughs was told officially, although your case is settled, you will never be told what actually happened to you. Oh. So for 40 years, John Burroughs has tried to find out what it was he was really exposed to. What shredded his heart valves? What affected his vision? and what possibly altered his entire body DNA. Powerful stuff, 
and a quest. So how did I get involved? Well, that's a really good story. I was approached by a slightly mysterious figure who wanted me to get in touch with John Burroughs because John Burroughs' injuries and the Rendlesham Forest incident, according to Nick Pope from the MOD, quote, is the key to unlocking the mystery of UAP. Now, I kind of agree. So much of flying saucer UFO stuff is good personal witnesses, but no real evidence. John Burroughs nearly died. John Burroughs' condition can be linked back to an actual physical effect. Doctors and scientists know what injured John Burroughs. It's real. Because of that fact, and being a bit of an old media sceptic, I totally bought into John Burroughs' story. Because if we understand what he was exposed to, we understand what was going on. So I became part of the team as the filmmaker, and I hopefully my personal hobby, the history of physics, has been useful. But I think the thing that I've really done to help this investigation is ask these obvious questions. Who, what, where, when, and why? Seemingly innocent questions, well known to all reporters to ask in any case. The best one is where? Well, Rendlesham Forest is the answer. Oh no, let's look at the big picture of where. Where is Rentlesham Forest? Well, it's in Suffolk, England. Yeah, so why did a strange event happen in Suffolk, England? Well, Rentlesham Forest is a piece of scrubby, Forestry Commission, very sparsely populated woodland between two highly guarded, secret US Air Force NATO bases to the north Bent Waters, which is US Air Force Europe's nuclear tactical base, and Woodbridge. Oh, Woodbridge is often ignored. We all talk about Bent Waters, but Woodbridge is the command center of US Air Force Crash Recovery, Space Command. Aha! And what's the relevance of the county of Suffolk? Oh, Suffolk is the home of Orford Ness, Britain's advanced physics weapon test site. Just down the road from Rendlesham Forest is Bordsey Manor, Britain's secret radar development centre. Just four miles west of Rendlesham Forest is this place, Marconi's secret lab at the post office test centre at Martlesham Heath in a Dastral House. Does that all start to add up? It did to me. Just in front of Rendlesham Forest, we've got Britain's main weapon testing zone. Just down the road, we've got Bordsey, where they developed all the secret radar and plasma weapons. And just over there, we've got Martlesham Heath, which is the computer control centre and the headquarters of Marconi UK. And what's in the middle? Rendlesham Forest. So that's the kind of questions that I want to ask. Just by asking the simple question, where, you reveal a bigger picture. And that's just the answer to the simple question, where. When we look at the question, when, suddenly we have SDI, Star Wars, funding, Michael Heseltine, Margaret Thatcher, big money coming to the UK for advanced weapon testing in Suffolk? Then you can go through the rest. Who, what and why? Oh, all good questions that we have answers to. So today, to present evidence to you to what really might have happened at Rendlesham Forest, you need to understand the weaponization of physics. And the most fascinating evidence of the weaponization of physics is the accident called Foo Fighters, you are in for a treat. James Warrow has found the evidence. I've found the pictures. Race Hobbs has read the script. And John Burroughs understands exactly the weaponization of radar 
that made Foo Fighters possible. The weaponization of light, plasma, and Foo Fighters. Toward the end of World War II, mission updates from the 415th Night Fighter Squadron took a mysterious turn. Along with details of dogfights over the German-occupied Rhine Valley, pilots began reporting inexplicable lights following their aircraft. One night in November 1944, a Bristol Bowfighter crew, pilot Edward Schluter, radar observer Donald J. Myers, and intelligence officer Fred Ringwald, was along the Rhine north of Strasbourg. They described seeing eight to ten bright orange lights off their left wing, flying through the air at high speed. Neither the airborne radar nor ground control registered anything nearby. Schluter turned toward the lights and they disappeared, the report continued. Later, they appeared much farther away. The display continued for several minutes, then disappeared. Myers gave these objects a name. Taking a response word used by characters in a popular Smokey Stover firefighter cartoon, Foo Fighters. Reports kept coming in. The objects flew alongside aircraft at 200 miles an hour. They were red or orange or green. They appeared singly or with as many as 10 others in formation, and they often outmaneuvered the airplanes they were chasing. Foo Fighters got the attention of Allied Command, who wondered if they were really a new Nazi terror weapon. Winston Churchill made these strange glowing balls his top priority. Why? Because the UK and USA suspected Germany had perfected a plasma direct energy weapon that they themselves had been working on and failed to perfect. We can tell you today, Foo Fighters were a man-made weapon, but strangely, an unintentional byproduct of a secret radar technology the Germans were using. And weirdly, the German military probably did not realize their continuous wave-focused radar was producing. Today, let's examine facts about what Foo Fighters really are. The following was written by Chris Allen Broca. Foo Fighters and Microwave Oven Plasma Balls. The mysterious appearance of Foo Fighters over the skies of World War II and their equally mysterious disappearance after the cessation of hostilities constitutes one of the stranger episodes in the history of atmospheric physics. Bright lights were reported to follow aircraft. They were observed in all theaters of war. Common opinion on most sides held that they were enemy secret weapons or UFOs. Little evidence indicating this surfaced following the end of the war, and they were variously explained as corona discharges, or ball lightning, or other electromagnetic or optical phenomena. The idea that these lights were produced by radar beams interacting with ionized gas, particularly engine exhaust, offers a fascinating insight into these strange objects. How could a novel German radar produce an ionized ball of plasma? 
Some German radars focused EM energy using parabolic reflectors. Others utilized Yagi Uda or other dipole antenna arrays. Not knowing the specifics, we will estimate that 250 kilowatts went out over an area of roughly one square mile. These early radars poured their energy out in a continuous stream. If a radar beam were to end up focused on an area where an airplane was discharging hot, probably rather ionized exhaust, a plasma ball might form which would grow in luminescence. A concern may arise the radar supplies energy to the ball and pulses, whereas we are approximating it as a continuous stream of power. Simulations have been performed with a source turning off and on rapidly. Once fully developed, the plasma ball would glow with the apparent brightness of a roughly 660 watt incandescent light bulb. We have shown that the interaction of microwave energy with hot ionized air can very well produce the kinds of phenomena encountered by World War II flyers. At the end, World War II British troops were instructed to get all the equipment and research into German radar and early Nazi experiments with fiendishly horrible X-ray directed energy weapons. These were designed to kill humans at a great distance by exposing pilots to high doses of X-ray radiation. All this research returned to the UK where it was assessed and redeveloped as British weapons. A lot of that work being carried out by the National Radar Lab at Bowsey, Suffolk. Interestingly, only a few miles from Rendlesham Forest. By the Cold War, the UK and US were using German-style continuous wave radar capable of producing plasma effects similar to Foo Fighters. Type 87 Scorpion continuous wave radars were stationed in and around the area of Bentwaters and Woodbridge in 1980. According to engineer Winston Keach, this radar would be powerful enough to cause plasma effects if focused at a relatively short range. It would also be ideal for feeding and steering targeting plasmas for phase conjugate directed energy weapons, such as the Star Wars weapons program, as well as a remote power charging system for an unmanned UAV aircraft. If local earth energy became entrained through the electrical earthing of the system, because of the continuous energy flow of the transmitter, then if a plasma were generated in a local atmosphere, not only would the tracking motions of the radar sweep the glowing plasma around the sky in that area, they would have three nominal tracking mode search patterns, theoretically right down to ground level, but it would also phase conjugate the earth energy to that focus point of the plasma in a process known as a four-way mixer. This would deliver concentrated earth energy to that remote point, just like a directed energy weapon delivering a laser or maser blast. Not only would this energize the plasma and any object that the plasma contacts, but if that object or sufficiently charged plasma moved close enough to the ground, there would be something very much like a lightning strike to the ground. 
the dripping molten metal effect described by Colonel Charles Halt is also a plasma optical effect caused by electron bunching in conductive plasma channels, a little bit like the streamer conduction channels that open up the air to trigger a lightning flash. Could such an effect also leave behind marks in the ground that were reported after night one of the famous Rendlesham Forest incident? Another novel physics device was exploited by the military and weaponized the high power laser and maser. During the late 1960s through the 1970s and 80s, at these heights of the Cold War, our military industrial complex sought new ways to exploit lasers. Dr. Robert Q. Fugate. Dr. Fugate, a member of the scientific and professional cadre of senior executives, is the senior scientist for atmospheric compensation at the Starfire Optical Range, Directed Energy Directorate, Air Force Research Laboratory, Kirkland Air Force Base, New Mexico. The range operates 1.5 and 3.5 meter telescopes and a 1.0 meter beam director. He conducts a research program on atmospheric propagation physics, atmospheric compensation using laser guide star adaptive optics, and the acquisition, tracking, and pointing of lasers to Earth orbiting satellites. The research program also includes the development of sensors, instrumentation, and mount control of large aperture ground-based telescopes. McCray asks, So when you first arrived in New Mexico, what types of projects were you associated with? Fugate answers, The first project I was associated with was actually out here at the SOR. Now, at the time, when I got here, the SOR was almost closed. There was no activity here in the mid-1970s. They had a 100,000 watt CO2 laser. It was one of three lasers built by Pratt & Whitney in Florida called the Tri-Service Laser. The Army had one, the Navy had one, and the Air Force had one. They shot down a drone airplane with that laser in 1974. Project Delta, that is threat warning. I worked on sensors that would discriminate laser light from other non-coherent sources like sun glint. Another area I worked on was remote detection, a potential characterization of high energy lasers, the type suitable for weapons like the airborne laser. The concept is to detect my or Rayleigh scattered photons from a high power beam that is being propagated through the atmosphere between two points, the laser and the target on the ground. This was being done at US test sites in Florida, New Mexico and California. And the question was, was it also being done in the Soviet Union? Lasers turned out to be another way to produce airborne plasma effects. The following is from a translation by George Hoskins. Is it technically possible to produce a shining point floating, as it were, in the sky? Without it, however, simply being a case of projection onto the background of clouds? In order to reply to this question, we need here to introduce the concept of plasma, which appeared in 1928. A plasma is a fluid composed of electrically neutral gaseous molecules and of positive ions and negative electrons. In short, it is an ionized gas giving off photons by virtue of this ionization and therefore more or less luminous. 
By using a powerful laser and a converging lens, it is possible to ionize air locally at the point of focusing. If, for example, the lens has a focal distance of one meter, a bubble of plasma forms itself miraculously at a distance of one meter from the lens and seems to float in the air. By using an infrared laser, the rays of which are normally invisible to the naked eye, the result is very spectacular. But in order to project this UFO at a great distance, it would be necessary to use a very powerful laser and a lens capable of focusing at a distance of projection. It is, therefore, more efficient to use a matrix of lasers converging towards a given point in the sky. The first high-energy lasers worked by means of carbon dioxide and within the infrared scale. They appeared in the United States in 1968. The CO2 was inserted at one end of the laser while the residual non-toxic gases were expelled on the other side. The first attempts to convert this into a transportable weapon was carried out by the U.S. Army. Towards the middle of the 70s, a CO2 laser with a power of 30 kilowatts was mounted on a Caterpillar tracked vehicle, LVTP-7, so as to create a mobile test unit. At the end of the 70s, the German Dial Company came up with a similar prototype, the Helix High Energy Laser Experimental. It consisted of a 28-ton armored vehicle to carry a high-energy CO2 laser with a power of several megawatts, whose range in clear weather would have reached 10 kilometers. The required consumption of CO2 would allow up to 50 laser shots at each sortie. Radiant ionization. This is produced when the atoms are subjected to electromagnetic radiation whose photons have an energy higher than the threshold of ionization. This situation is encountered naturally in the upper atmosphere where ultraviolet photons originating from the sun ionize the gaseous atoms in the ionosphere layer. Since 1991, it has been known that scientists working on President Reagan's strategic defense initiative that it was possible to simulate the fluorescence of a sodium layer saturated at the height of 90 kilometers by means of a laser ray, a photon ray, so as to create a luminous point. This technique for producing an artificial star, but also a UFO was rediscovered in 1985 by two French astronomers and has since been used for focusing telescopes. The beam which is used can also be in the high frequency scale or the hyper frequencies. The focusing of these waves can be obtained at a specific point in space from a matrix of antennae emitting phased waves. Thanks to the technique of synthetic aperture, this matrix can simulate the effects of a giant lens with a very long focal distance. During his acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize, Piotr Kapitsa described as early as 1978 the Soviet experiments in generating plasma at a distance by means of powerful microwaves. In the United States, this technique is used by the Air Force to produce atmospheric, ionospheric mirrors, AIM for short, which enable them to make radar waves rebound so as to explore what lies beyond the horizon or to do the same with radio waves, allowing them to communicate between two precise positions. 
These mirrors also allow them to intercept or to jam enemy communications. Everyone can experiment for himself with creating a plasma with the help of a beam of microwaves emitted by a magnetron. All one needs for this is to place a fresh grape on a saucer in a microwave oven. Very quickly the grape burst into flames and the series of flames thus created, which are nothing other than balls of plasma, fly up towards the top of the oven where they survive for a little while thanks to the stimulation of microwaves whose frequency is here 2.45 gigahertz. Microwaves were first produced artificially by Hernreich Hertz in 1887. The magnetron was invented in 1921 and the klystron in 1938. As for the first maser, the equivalent of a laser for microwaves, it first appeared in 1953. This technology, probably still in its infancy, was therefore already available in 1942. In order to generate plasma, the photon beam can be replaced by the emission of other particles such as protons or electrons. A synchrotron can generate a beam of protons sufficiently energetic for them to cross a certain distance in the atmosphere while only giving off very weak radiation caused by a slight loss of energy. When this energy descends below a certain threshold, because of these losses, the protons can no longer go forward in the atmosphere and the remaining energy, still significant, then ionizes the oxygen and the nitrogen so as to form a shining ball of plasma, a luminous point in the sky. By adjusting the proton energy, one can decrease or increase the distance at which a luminous plasma is formed. A rapid adjustment backwards and forwards can thus give off the illusion of a streak of light formed in the sky. In the same way, by altering the quantity of protons emitted, one can lower or increase the luminous intensity of the plasma. Finally, one can play with the direction of the firing so as to produce a specific luminous shape by applying a sweeping motion. This kind of production is within the capabilities of the military, which is able to generate luminous phenomena either from the background or from an aerial platform, probably a dirigible balloon. More recently, a new weapon of light may be on the horizon in regards to a scalable effects laser. The U.S. Marines are developing a new laser weapon that can transmit voice messages at long range or be turned up to deafen or dazzle or even kill. The scalable compact ultra short pulse laser system will be mounted on a truck or a tank. It will initially be used as a non-lethal weapon for crowd control, according to U.S. government documents. The aim of the project is to develop a lightweight and energy efficient next generation ultra short pulse laser system that can produce sustainable and controllable plasma at a range capable of inducing a full spectrum of scalable, non-lethal effects. The weapon works using an igniter laser that fires an intense, short pulse powerful enough to create a ball of plasma. This can be created in mid-air or on the surface of a target. A stronger detonator laser then explodes the plasma ball which can be used to create enhanced, non-lethal effects such as flashbang effects, thermal ablation for pain, and delivery of intelligible voice commands at range, according to military documents. However, the weapon could also eventually be used to kill. So, were these the human weapon systems being tested in Rendlesham Forest? 
Is it possible a craft could be projected or manifest in the sky made out of plasma? U.S. Air Force Tech Sergeant John Burroughs encountered highly strange effects in December 1980. Here are his thoughts on what he experienced. I am not saying I know what the phenomenon was or what we encountered, only that it was an unidentified aerial phenomena and the fact that it existed is indisputable. Credited with the ability to hover, land, take off, accelerate to exceptional velocities, and vanish, they can reportedly alter their direction of flight suddenly and clearly can exhibit aerodynamic characteristics well beyond those of any known aircraft or missile, either manned or unmanned. In the UK Ministry of Defense Project Condine report, the MOD admitted that this phenomenon presents itself as having exceptional capabilities, some of which match the second layer of Valet and Davis's taxonomy of high strangeness, which they label as anti-physical effects. Correlating a number of these effects, along with a number of effects in layer four, physiological effects, with effects observed reported at Rendlesham leads one to conclude that the author did, to a degree, consider the actual phenomenon in the craft of the memorandum. I have to consider something I encountered would eventually require me to have open heart surgery to replace a badly shredded interior mitral valve. Must It does not matter where the hell it came from, whether it's a black budget or another civilization, if the phenomenon leaves that kind of evidence behind it and performs in that manner, it is of a considerable defense interest. And if it is indeed the result of a black budget program, then one of the interests would be to conceal that fact. What exactly John encountered is still unknown but his injuries reveal the frequencies that were present that horrible night. The heart valve shredding is a known effect of exposure to high levels of plasma and non-ionizing radiation associated with intense radar energy. John Burroughs lived through the event, despite efforts to keep the truth quiet by the U.S. Air Force. Could he have been a victim of advanced physics? Weaponized by a military developing novel weapons? Or did John Burroughs encounter an unknown force, a force that nearly killed him? These questions are key to what we are exploring in this program. Well, that was such a fascinating program. I think with the wonderful research of James Morrow and the fantastic insights of John Burroughs for the first time in 70 years since the end of World War II, we have put forward a very, very viable theory to what Foo Fighters actually were. And much more importantly, how the energy used to create them was known prior to World War II, why Winston Churchill and the Allies really understood and worried that the Germans had a directed energy weapon because they knew what directed energy weapons are all about. And tonight, let's talk with James and John and catch up on their thoughts on this fantastic program. I'm gonna dive right into John Burroughs. John Burroughs retired US Air Force, and of course, witnessed something strange at Rendlesham Forest, amongst doing many other things in his wonderful career. But John, when you were at Bentwaters Woodbridge in the 1980s, Good reports from your research and James Warrow's research through the scientist Winston Keach says that down the road from Randlesham Forest, 
Bentwaters and Woodbridge at a place called RAF Bordsey. Amazingly, they were using the same type of radar system, a continuous wave radar, which I hope we've made clear in this film is the type of energy that can accidentally or on purpose produce plasma discharges in the sky. Were you aware that those systems were nearby? And do you think they could have had anything to do with the manifestations that you actually saw in Rendlesham Forest? The first question is, were we aware, was I aware of how the radars worked and what they were capable of? No. Was I aware right. that there was a radar facility in the area? Sure. I mean, we had our own radars on Bentwaters, and, and I know Bowsey was there, and I also knew it was tied into Eastern Radar. But right. understanding the capabilities of not only the development of radar, but then what they've learned from radar and being able to create from radar came way down the, the line. And what's interesting is radars, the death ray and everything else all tie into frequencies. And not right. only do they tie into frequencies, but if you look at Condine, they talk about frequencies. They also go into the fact that these frequencies can affect the human bio biology, you know, including the mind itself. Right. And if you go into Condine, which again, over and over, I say this, but it's been overlooked because partly people have tried to discredit the author because of some of his other a book that he wrote and some of his religious beliefs. But now what's getting interesting is you can tie all this together with the fact that these frequencies are being weaponized. Okay. And why did Condine say that this UAP, whatever it is, which the problem with it is, is the fact that the, the sources are not, available to read why he came to this conclusion in his report. So you have a report, but you can't go back to the source he drew from for the report. Some of it was still blacked out the last time I looked at Condine, and some of it's not been revealed at all. Right. But the author was, the interesting thing about this author was he was the pilot, he also was an engineer, and he was an engineer for Marconi Company. Now, if you could trace back the death ray, the radar systems and everything else, it all ties back into Marconi mm -hmm. to include Tesla's work because Marconi and Tesla, because, and I don't want to cross a line, but they had an interaction. I'm not sure how friendly right. it was or competitive uh -huh. it was. I can't say for sure at this point, but they clearly were competing based off the same technology. And the interesting thing was that the Nazis or the Germans, because the Nazis mm -hmm. offend people sometimes, but the word just itself offends people, which it should, were clearly into this research before America or Russia were. And then after the war, World War II happened, that's when Project Paper, Paperclip happened with the Americans and right. whatever project the Russians did, which where I'm going with this is it all ties in, I think, to what we're dealing with, period, to include the fact that what we observed out there. Because at the point when we went out there, we didn't know about any of this. No. And it's just through research over the years and declassified documents and stuff and some other things that have been stated that point to the capabilities that what this is what probably some of, if not a lot of what we saw was taking place. The question is, how much of it was being controlled by man? Uh, that's a fantastic answer. Um, quickly, before I bring in James, I'm going to ask our viewers, and you two are really simple, but not very well-known question. John raised it. So at the end of World War II, the Allies, let's just call them um, the Soviet Union, the United States, and the United Kingdom, all took spoils of war. And it's very well known that the United States, through Operation Paperclip that John Burroughs just mentioned, took the minds, the scientists, and many, not only in engineering fields, but also in medicine and other fields, and made them American citizens and took their knowledge. The Russians very much took the built V2 rockets, and that gave them a leg up to actually have an early successful space program. So viewers and you two, what did Britain have as spoils of war? Either of you know? 
All right, I'm going to tell you. All right, two things. And I think people um, don't know this very well. One, they took something called HDP, which is high test peroxide, which is an oxidizing agent used in German uh, submarine torpedoes and very much in the V2 rocket. Because Britain is, British military is very controlled by the Navy, and they wanted an oxidizing agent uh, for their submarines. But the second thing they took was German continuous wave radar and directed energy weapon technology. The, the Germans were working on directed energy weapons. They had an X-ray device that would fry humans inside aircraft. They had a directed energy device that would disrupt um, magnetic instruments in planes. And then they had, I think by default, this continuous wave radar that they weren't, I think, aware of was producing ionizing effects. But the Brits were aware of it, hence they knew exactly what Foo Fighters were. And that's what I think we've said in this film. And where did that research go to? Oh, uh, Bordsey Manor, <laughs> down the road from Orford Ness, down the road from Rendlesham Forest. It all begins to make sense. James Warrow, why do you think Britain has so much interest in plasma technology. And what can plasma technology as a weapon really do? Hello, Sean. Hello, Sean. Right. Um, the the idea behind um, a lot of the, um, the plasma effects from radar um, were, were initially um, noticed uh, using over-the-horizon radars. Um, the over horizon radars um, could sometimes uh, ionize uh, the atmosphere at a certain point uh, as a mirror to focus down onto a nuclear sites. Now, the, the Soviets were, were trying this out on US sites and potentially British sites. And the US were also experimenting with this uh, against uh, Soviet sites, nuclear uh -huh. sites. Now, what we've got to look at is um, the, the the comparison on these a lot of these reports uh, where these balls of light uh, seem to appear over nuclear sites. Now, we both know that they were looking at each other's sites using over-the-horizon radar. Right. Uh, and we also know that um, using over-the-horizon radar can sometimes create a, 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 a mirror effect basically it creates a mirror effect and depending on the nature of the uh the air at the time and the, the distance and uh bouncing from the ionosphere um could you can basically create a ball of light and um and the the oh, i'm probably just skirting your question at the moment but because the thought was that are some of these actual balls of light hovering over these uh nuclear sites actually part of an over the horizon radar system. Wow. Uh, the over horizon radar system basically was being used just so each side could um, know if, for instance, missiles were being launched, they would have a, a, a more of a time window to know, right. um, you know, who, who, would, whether or not something was being launched. So technically, they'd have a little bit more of a time window before they was in the air and they couldn't do anything about it. Um, um, what the, the the Soviets were using at the time, um, uh, through the seventies, as far as I know, even back in the early sixties when it was being built, um, was the uh, the Dugar, the woodpecker. Mm -hmm. Now this was being used um, just just about, that's I think sixty kilometers or, or sixty miles, forgive me, um, from the what we know now as Chernobyl uh, in Ukraine, um, and the. The power that that was giving off apparently was extremely low. Uh, oh, sorry, extremely low frequencies. Um, that's what they were trying to use. Uh, and we, throughout these things, the seventies and the the eighties, um, intelligence uh, in both USA and uh, in United Kingdom, as well as even like ham operators and things like that, were picking up the signal. Uh -huh. And it was they called it the woodpecker because it was a. T -t 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 it was a chirping signal. And I couldn't understand where that was coming from. Um, but it, if, for instance, that was also being trained onto Rendlesham Forest or, as I say, the base, uh, Woodbridge uh, or Bent Waters, um, the extremely low frequencies seemed to be a little bit of a, 
how do I say, a lot of it is very sort of classified in the sense of its potential effects on on, on humans and, and things like that. Right. Um, and just to note that a lot of the people at um, the, the bases seem to experience, from what I've, I've spoken to a few members uh, that were there at the time, um, and extreme depressions, um, anxieties, mm-hmm. uh, confusion, um, and things just felt like there was something there that just didn't feel right. Now, whether or not this was something to do with the local area or whether this was to do with right. what was being focused into the area at the time is up for question. Right. Uh, and with the continuous wide radar, for instance, the, the argument we was putting forward was, is there... Um, I mean, the continuous wave radars, um, which were, would, if they interact with something of extremely low, high power, but extremely low frequency, what kind of effects would that cause? Right. Now, looking in, looking in old uh, Russian literature and um, experiments they were doing, they was basically trying to create things like that themselves um, mm. using um, radar uh, devices and dishes and what they would do, they would have, um, as far as I can remember, they'd have like a, an extremely low frequency discharge from one and an extremely high discharge from another. And when the beams actually crossed, it would create a ball of light in between both beams. But the problem they had, and Andrew Pipe actually spoke about this in his book, um, The Rendlesham File, the problem they had was keeping this ball of light stable. Right. The reason they... they we were experimenting with this back at the time was because of the electricity and stuff and a lot of local towns and that back in the USSR didn't have, you know, enough power, electricity and things like that. Right. Uh, and the nights would be very dark and they wanted to basically illuminate towns. Wow. Sort of cheap method. Right. The problem they had was this ball of light would sometimes come become detached from the beams when an aircraft went over. Uh... It would go straight up and try to follow the aircraft. You know, right. So, um, I mean, the idea of um, creating balls of light for maybe um, purposes such as that would, would always intrigue, you know, the, the UK and the USSR uh, and, and the United States. Sorry, yeah. Um, and those were the sort of things that they they were they were looking at, not only just decoys but possible of light to take down an aircraft and this in in the uk hang on a minute this was all going on in suffolk <laughs> i mean the it seems that randleson forest bent waters and woodbridge was surrounded by uk laboratories who were actually at the center, the Marconi operation at Marshalsham, the weapons testing at Orford Ness, the radar development at Bordsley, and possibly the power source at Sizewell Nuclear Power Station. Is this, you two, do you think that's just a coincidence that Rendlesham... Well, if you don't mind me s- suggesting, it would be a, a, another good reason why the... Um why the Soviets will be so interested within that area and try right. to gain as much data from that area using over-the-horizon methods. Right, right. What do you okay. think, John? Well, here's an interesting tidbit, right? right? You brought up the history of Foo Fighters, World War II. Well, and then you said the Germans, scientists were split between America, Britain, and right. Soviet Union, right? What's been overlooked is the Italians were part of uh, the German axis, okay? Right. And they were involved in this technology too. And that would, the company that was involved in that technology was the Marconi company. Right. Now, what's interesting is nowhere have I seen where Marconi worked with the Russians. The Marconi company went to work with, with what's called NATO now, the Allies, and, and they based their operations in the United Kingdom. And not only did they base it there, but BAA Systems bought them out eventually. Right. So if you, that's been an underlooked part of this whole technology thing is what the Italians' involvement was as far as the Marconi company itself. 
and their scientists and what they believed and what were they working on with the Germans because that company was formed in 1924. I so thought, yeah. Right. No, that's a really good point. I'd never thought of Marconi, Italy, Italy, part of the uh, Axis powers. Oh, yeah, that's a really good point. John, a hard question. These frequencies that were either targeted at the United Kingdom, at you personally, do you think they we are messing around with things? Why why are why are these people doing it? You know, could there be a military advantage? You know, are they things that we should be messing around with? And why do you think they're interested in weaponizing these forces of nature? And are they unleashing forces that we don't yet fully understand? Well, the, the first part of the question is easy to answer. I did FOIA with the MOD who admitted they were weaponizing the uh, UAP technology. I, they admitted to it. They blacked out what they were doing, hmm. but they were involved in it. The Condon report says, I believe the author said we should look at it further. He didn't say they were, but he said it should be addressed hmm. as being used as a weapon. Okay, so yeah, they are. Um, some of the things that we haven't talked about is the not only does the UK where they were developing this, but there's geological reasons of things that could be creating some of these effects. Right. Never mind, there's an ancient burial ground there. Mm -hmm. And that, then you have to look at why the burial ground existed there in that particular point anyway, and what the, what the, the people, the, the ancient people understand. But you have to look at the, also the fact that the author that Dick Condine wrote a book that was banned. Right. And you can't find it anywhere. And it has to do with technology, Israel, and and religion. Okay? So most books that are controversial, they put them out and they discredit it. This book wasn't even allowed to be discredited. It was just banned. And then you have to go further and say that when you look at Andrew Pike's work, he was down there studying this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And he put a book out. And then he pulled that book. And did he pull the book because the British government wasn't happy with some secrets that may have been revealed? And and ultimately, the word magic comes up when you're working on things that are possible, like physics involving, like, say, the latest advancement in physics right now that's going on. Right. And it's magic because the majority of the people don't even know it exists or if they understand they even or if they do know it exists they don't understand what the capabilities of the, the physics are you know what i mean quantum is the latest thing so you have all this technology being looked at and and guess what i can't speak for other governments i'm not from the uk or these other governments but it clearly seems that our our government is hiding the secret of this technology and that with this group that's come out that's forced a little bit of this into the forefront, that the Gang of Eight, which you can look it up, folks, is the highest level inside Congress. People inside Congress have got some briefings on this, and they're now willing to pull the latest bill that was going to force some more of this stuff to come out. You know what I mean? I so do. I think, I think it's just fa what you just raised is fascinating. Because it raises that enormous issue of that we're living in a society now as as peasants and we are being controlled by magicians. And I think that really occurred at um in started in World War II when the Manhattan Project. You have to remember that the atomic weapon was just a thought experiment. And to actually make it real, make it go bang, was an immense use of very advanced physics, which at the time had to be kept secret. But none of those secrets have ever come out into the open. Since World War II ended, physics has carried on to expand boundaries of how we understand the universe. Every single thing, it seems to me, of physics that comes out is weaponized. It's immediately funded by large defense contractors at university level 
to see if there is a tweak, an advantage for a hidden magician to pull physics out of the hat for against us, members of the public. Now, you can see why it would be a military advantage. But right now, what you just said, John, is very interesting about this disclosure through Congress. I thought we were maybe getting somewhere, but maybe the defense contractors, the ones who really are building these type of weapons, who know what they've really got, what rabbits they've really got in their hat, don't want it revealed. And maybe in the end, we're not get, going to get any UAP disclosures because it's too financially and politically hot potato. You know, what, well, what, can I what, make a point? Two yeah, points? yeah. Number one, you got it wrong. The, the funding doesn't come from the defense industry. The funding comes from the taxpayer. Well, right. The defense industry then takes that funding and creates these weapons, then turns around and sells it to other countries, which are funded by their taxpayers. Right. Okay. So it's not, the defense industry has really no skin in the game other than they're getting money. You know, they're receiving money from us peasants, but the rabbit in the hat thing, this interesting is they are weaponizing all this correct, but my biggest question is, is it just popped up recently. Why are we spending money to leave this planet instead of trying to protect and make it a better planet to live on? What are they aware of or what's taking place right now that they're aware of that they want to take civilization outside? Now, one of the speculations is there's certain minerals on asteroids like they just sent a probe to an asteroid they got some stuff from that maybe some of these materials aren't alien like alien from a crack Christ crap but they came from outer space yeah okay maybe the moon holds some materials that will advance us technically right i'm not disagreeing with any of that but mm -hmm. why the race to get off this planet when it's clear the planet's dying everybody's saying it is why aren't we trying to protect the planet and use this technology to make it a better place to live. And that yeah. is something that I think we're looking at as a group here. And the other factor that I'm bringing into this is I think that it's easy to get caught up on what secrets are being kept and are aliens real, but there's a lot of evidence out there, including 38 papers, scientific stuff that's out there that we need to take a closer look at, right. which would lead us down the path of, what exactly are we trying to create and why? And that's, I hope, what us as a group, what this is a podcast, what these are films, what the great research that we're all doing is actually exposing. Uh, James, what do you think on this big picture that John's um, very clearly laid out that we need to be saving our planet and not spending all this money on advanced technology? you know, for, for weapons. Yeah, I agree. I agree that, um, you know, we, uh, we we do need to save this planet. Um, I totally agree with that. But the potential uh, methods of uh, for a complete reversal of change, for instance, you know, nuclear uh, fusion um, mm -hmm. and even the Chinese trying to create their own star in a bubble, you know, to create a nuclear fusion process whereby you could, you know, the amount of energy that, that that would technically produce, you know, would cut our our, our need to, to for fossil fuels and right. and uh, uh, and other you know extractions from the earth. But again, with that, you then need an infrastructure for that to actually work and to run. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think we could do it. I mean, because, yeah, yeah. Well, because because of the, I mean. The, Again, this is where it comes back to secrecy. Um, mm. Whoever does that, whoever seems to find the the magic key mm -hmm. um, to things like this, it will. The last thing they would want is to want to share that with anyone. Okay. Uh, again, the reason they uh, the United States, for instance, may not want to share this with the United Kingdom is because it's okay for them to monitor their own situation, like the Five Eyes. It's okay for each Five Eyes mem member to monitor what who is infiltrating their governments, but to, mm -hmm. to find out who might be infiltrating another government, for instance, United Kingdom, be it China or Russia, it's a lot harder to do. 
Mm. Um, and for them to share secrets with us, for instance, the UK, they would be opening themselves up to potential right. secrets being... Because, I mean, during, uh, for instance, United States, during the Cold War and that, you know, we, we had infiltrations, you know, by the Russians. We had double agents and we had even our own members of parliament, you know, working with the Russians and then defecting over there right. and stuff. And um, no matter what sort of time frame, that, that always seems to happen. And I think learning by mistakes, they may be just literally trying to keep their own the Pandora's box shut because they don't want anyone else to... You know, to 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 be able to utilise this they, as typical things. If you've got something that you think is unique to any anywhere else, the last thing you want to do is speak about it. I you so know. agree. And the thing I think that we, as a team, James and John and myself, involved in this, is we are doing citizen science we are looking behind the curtain for secrets we are cutting through the red tape we're not breaking any um national security guidelines everything that we mention to you and tell to you is not classified i mean it's all in the public domain but by us digging deeper into what's actually going on I think we are revealing some very interesting trends and facts about what is actually happening. And I think the questions we're raising, John Burroughs tonight, you know, just asked some fantastically important questions about the future of mankind. And we're not going to get disclosure from government. Government and the military are the very people who have the laws surrounding them because they made them not to, to tell secrets, not to tell disclosure. And I think it's up to people like us and people who know how to ask questions to actually reveal what might be going on behind that curtain. The Manhattan Project, they started with scientists. They quickly came to a conclusion that the first part of the project they were working on wasn't going to work. Right. But they kept that division active and they used that as a counter intel to the Russians to make them believe that that's what they were working on. And that was going to lead to the nuclear bomb. OK, then they created a completely smaller division that was more compartmentalized than the first one. And they developed the way to, to detonate the nuclear bomb safely. But the Russians fell for the first part of the project and they spent all their mind, mon time and money on that. And that put them almost a decade behind our advancement in the initial explosion of the nuclear bomb, never mind our advancement going forward in the right. nuclear field. OK, fast forward to UFOs. If and I used to poke fun at these newbies that come into the UFO world, they get really mad at me. If you don't know the history of ufology, then you're not going to know what's going on today. Over and over, these same very people with New people being added, like at one point DeLong was involved. Now you have Mellon out there. But if you look at the court and then Nola, but you look at the court Green and Put Off and Davis and those guys, they've been involved in this for three or four decades or longer. Put Off goes back to the 50s and 60s, okay? Mm -hmm. They've been playing this game of technology advancement since then. And Put off was the project matter for Stargate that they kept going for, I think, a decade or two. And it's still going, but he just gave up the project to a different agency. The point being is, how much of this is real? How much of this is, is a, a counter intel to make the other sides go down different paths and waste their money and effort to do something that's not going to evolve into anything that they're already aware of? And these very scientists that are doing this now that are still in this today in their 80s and 90s mm -hmm. they're they're the ones that have been driving this for 40 years yeah yeah and they want you to believe that they have the american people and the world's interests that they understand that we have to understand what we're dealing with the disclosure when right. all these very projects that they worked on have always been classified and the majority of what involved right. has never come out still to this day is still classified Right. But they want the public to get on board to force Congress 
to get involved in declassifying this stuff when they know very well it's never going to happen. Never going to happen. Nor has some of these main people testified. Why hasn't Bigelow testified? Rumors were that he held some of this material in his facility and he got government funding. That's a right. fact. Reed gave him money to study this. Why hasn't he testified? Right. Why hasn't Lou Alizondo testified? He supposedly ran this whole thing. You know, we can go down the list of people that have come forward but have never done, never been forced to testify on all this. So I think, folks, what I'm trying to say is don't hold your breath. 2017 came and gone. We're not at the end of 23. They're now gutting the bill that everybody thought was going to move disclosure forward. You're not going to get disclosure from the government now or ever. The only way you're going to understand it is to try to understand what the government is working on. And maybe if there's anything in that that can help benefit us peasants. That's my final take on this. Thank you for saying that, John. I think it's so really true. Disclosure isn't going to happen in the way that people expect. Do you agree, James? I agree. I agree with John. I agree with John. Um, for instance, I mean, Eric Davis is is known to be working behind the scenes with certain um, um, projects. Yet he's allowed to go on YouTube and 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 actually have a discussion with people and mm. describe what he's doing and and how he's doing it. And I'm thinking, well, if if you, if there's a if you sign a non disclosure agreement. Surely the last place you would be appearing is on YouTube. Right. So that 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 could be what John's just said is that there's a bit of smoke and mirrors going on here. Well, so possibly. there could be misdirection from some of these so-called um, UFO technologies to lead our enemies down the ro- up the garden path or in the wrong direction. So, yeah, again, I say we need to redouble our efforts keep up this task and actually look for the wonderful research that you two are doing and actually ask big questions because I don't think we're going to get disclosure from government any day soon because they don't want to give it to us. Thanks very much for watching, everybody. I think this was one of the most important films that we've made. I think it continues in a series that's leading up to the whole timeline of the Rendlesham Forest incident that, as everybody says, if you understand what happened at Rendlesham, you actually understand UAP. And I think now we're beginning to understand radar, directed energy weapons, frequencies and plasma and lots of other things and the involvement of the UK and the US and how they operate. There's more to come. Stay tuned and thank you very much for watching us. These things are real. They're here. This is happening now. A light appeared, and like a blue bar of light hovering over the road. On one side, witnesses could see it. On the other side, they couldn't see anything. Our night that we went out there, they were blasting the phenomenon of EM frequencies from Bowsey through the tunnels into the forest. Because those blue lights that we saw, plasma's being targeted by lasers. They were generating the phenomenon which was which was probably what they were hitting was the actual phenomenon, the exposure, what they created from blasting this energy. They got immediately merged into UFOs. uh, And I'm not sure what UFOs are, uh, but these aren't spacecraft. These aren't extraterrestrial. High power radars and ionospheric heaters are capable of making atmospheric plasmas. Now these are glowing balls of light, like um, like ball lightning. They can move from speeds that are stationary to many thousands of miles an hour. They will follow Earth energy gradients. If they're artificial, if it's by radar sweep, then they may be swept across the, the sky in regular or intelligent patterns. We have now released 
Last quick strike. Repeat. We have now released.